What's up guys, in my last Top Row study, we looked at a few 2D artworks and I saw some comments saying, hey, let's look at some 3D art. So we're gonna be doing that for this one. We are going to be looking at three different artists, a few of their different arts, kind of talking about some larger concepts and things that we can apply to our own work to improve, not just as 3D artists, but if you're a 2D artist or looking to improve in other art forms, I think a lot of this is gonna be really helpful. So let's not waste any more time here and dive right in by talking about one of my personally favorite digital sculptors, Pablo Perdomo. He has a, I, I can't even begin to describe his art style other than saying maybe something along the lines of exaggerated realism, almost classical uh, in, in terms of sculpture. This is something that is or was more common uh, back during the you know 1400s Renaissance-esque period. Uh, where a lot of our secondary forms in terms of anatomical shapes weren't necessarily accurate, but were more so designed to create something beautiful. And I wanna look at that here with Pablo's work. Uh, there's a lot of exaggeration going on. Obviously, Pablo understands a lot of anatomical form, but those forms are pushed to the extreme and designed expertly to create a very specific look and a very specific feel. If you are looking for some work to do a master study or master copy of Pablo, is your guy. All right, so let's take a look at some of these ideas here with some of these anatomical forms. And you'll actually notice how some of the anatomical shapes that he creates between these few different arms that we are going to look at change for the uh, different poses. And as you squash and stretch and twist your arm around, you're gonna get some different poses, but uh, your musculature shouldn't change all that much. So take a look at some of the carved in shapes that he's created, these nice strong divots through here, creating these beautiful separations, uh, kind of giving you periods of rest with these larger areas of shape here in the arm, and then these points of visual interest. Typically these points of visual interest are often placed at these separative forms where we go from one muscle into another. You know, like I said, anatomically, there's a lot of stuff that maybe isn't anatomically perfect or correct, but looking at some of these shapes, just the way that they are split here for this muscle, there are two larger heads of this muscle coming down your forearm on top of the shape. You have another muscle on the bottom of your forearm, very complex stuff going on here with the way that your arm twists in general, your bones actually uh, overlap over top of each other. It's called pronation and supination. It's not incredibly important, but what is, is we'll notice a few differences from the anatomy as we scroll down here to a couple other pieces. So we are going to use our bicep and surrounding muscles as an example, because everybody knows what a bicep is. Uh, let's look at a few examples of how these shapes kind of change as we look at these different arms. So here we have this bicep muscle coming down nice and long and stretched. Uh, that is because the arm is extended, stretching that muscle out. It's no longer pulling the arm up, kind of the main muscle that helps do that. Uh, you have a lot of other muscles going on there, but what we're looking at is a muscle called the brachialis and the coracobrachialis, which again, the names aren't extremely important, but what we're looking at is a muscle that extends down the side underneath your deltoid, right through here, creating this form here, which is just represented as a flat shape. And then we have the coracobrachialis, which is being represented by this form here on the inside portion of that arm. So notice how these shapes and the way that Pablo describes them changes as we go down here. Again, the arm is slightly bent here, obviously a lot more muscle mass, but look at that coracobrachialis muscle and how that is much shorter, more stiff. We're no longer seeing that long in, uh, extension between the bicep and tricep. Not only that, but we're getting this really hard edge and separation through here. Uh, looking at the outside portion of the arm, we're seeing a little more definition. We can also even see like the slightest little bump in the surface there, whether that's accidental or he's trying to call attention to some muscle fibers, whatever it might be. 
um, you know, there's some differences there. And then finally, in this last arm, another example of that long stretched out arm with that bicep shape, uh, a lot wider in the muscle, you know, more unique. Look at that shape for the uh, Corico Brachialis and how much more thick and long that is. So a lot of differences here in how these muscles and forms are being represented. I mean, just look at the overall gesture of this arm. This arm is wiggly as heck uh, if we're just looking at the main shape, but his anatomical knowledge is being used and exaggerated toward a specific effect. I mean, heck, even the colors being used are extremely exaggerated here. Looking at all the reds around the hand and fingertips, pushing on some of those forms, just some absolutely beautiful shapes going on here. Another really good example that I'll just call out here is look at the skin folding on the back of this wrist right here. It's an absolutely massive fold, but when you look at it, you don't necessarily immediately question it because the rest of the forms are kind of meeting us there. They're, they're fitting the same shape language of exaggerated realism. So a lot of really just beautiful sculpting going on here and a lot that I would love to integrate into my own work maybe do some studies of Pablo's work, maybe not just his hands, but his full bodies as well. He's got a lot of work and I would definitely go give Pablo a follow if you haven't already. Next up, we will be taking a look at Ente Ryu's work. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly and I apologize if I am not. All right, with Ente's work, we are going to be looking at their style and control of what I can only describe as controlled chaos. There is a lot going on here, specifically in terms of texture that I would like to look at with hair, fur, and feathers, and talk about how that is being used to control your attention and represent forms in a way that is not necessarily describing them realistically, but still kind of hitting the mark. So this is a piece that they created. Uh, I believe that this is the physical print and paint. Uh, I'm not entirely positive if that is correct or not, but I know that they did uh, physically create this piece. They printed it, painted it up, and uh, it might have been sold as a figure. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I'm sure you can find out from Entei's portfolio. Uh, let's look a little more closely, specifically at some of these areas of fur and hair. If you've never sculpted fur, hair, feathers, any of that, it's, uh, it's very difficult and there are a number of ways you can go about it. My personal favorite way to sculpt these forms is to not necessarily describe every single strand of hair, every single feather, but to instead describe the larger form and represent that in a stylized manner. Uh, this is something that's very difficult to do and Ente does it in a very remarkable way. Specifically, let's look at the fur over here for the wolf character represented right through here with the main form or texture flowing down the form of the body. We get some deviations from that flowing this direction, but for the most part, kind of following the flow of the uh, natural primary form. However, uh, there are these periods of rest, which we are going to look at in more detail. So these areas of high resolution are being used to control your attention, draw it there. It gives that immediate read or feel of fur. Obviously the fur is going to be longer here, maybe around the mane of the wolf, maybe more so around the ears, nice little earring up there. In my opinion, all wolves should have their ears pierced. It's just kind of a cool look. <laughs> Uh, looking at a couple other areas here with this owl, notice how there are once again these periods of rest where we almost have no texture at all, a very slight if anything in these areas around the chest. And then as that spreads out or flows out more so to the wings, we start seeing these big chunky forms representing these areas of feathers. And they don't necessarily immediately read as feathers, uh, but the larger form or combination of forms kind of gives us that nice illusion. Here's a really fantastic example where we're just getting these little hints of feathers right here at the bottom of the bird. But for the most part, it is um, relatively flat for the whole thing. You know, very small deviations on that, of course. Uh, we'll scroll down here and look at this moose in more detail because this is something that is just very, very difficult to achieve and uh, beautifully done here. So once again, 
fur being placed in specific areas to draw your attention. Notice the texture here around the nose, very slight, kind of following the flow of that primary form. Uh, a few areas here to add visual interest around the eye as well. Um, very slight kind of pushes in this direction, very kind of chaotic brush strokes in a way uh, with something like a standard or inflate brush that's just adding some texture to the surface. Yet, these areas are surrounded by these periods of rest. And that is kind of helping to draw attention to these areas. You know, we get some slight dimples down here, which isn't necessarily fur, but we're getting some skin texture, drawing more attention here to the primary form of the nostril. And then if we look at this piece as a whole, once again, the, this idea of periods of rest and texture is being used in such a beautiful way where if we look at the larger form of the entire moose or you know the entire form here that's being sculpted the texture serves as a framing device and the head which is where we want our audience uh, focus to be just as a larger kind of first read from way back here because that has such little texture ends up then becoming our area of focus. Again, something very hard to do, but if we go back up here, take a look at that fur and how that texture just kind of frames this entire larger area with this nice period of rest. This has been pushed even further with lighting to help keep the strength of the light here on the main portion of the face of the moose. Things kind of fading out and getting a little darker here as we go back keeping the focus and attention here on the most important, typically most important spot, the face. So just some beautiful control of fur, of hair, of feathers, and using that to control where you drive your audience's attention. We're gonna be talking about that idea of driving your audience's attention a lot more here with Ismail Nato. Again, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, but if not, I apologize. Let's take a look here at how Ismail uses presentation to drive our attention. You can be the best sculptor in the world, the best artist in the world, but if you can't present that in a nice way, in a readable way, you've kind of failed. And Ismail understands that very well. The simple fact is that most people are not 3D artists. Most people are not sculptors. And that means that they're most likely not going to appreciate a lot of the work that you've created. And that is no fault of their own. This is not anything against, you know, people that don't create 3D art at all. But we as artists need to direct the attention of our audience and make them care about what we have created. This character here could have been rendered or shown off from any angle. But what Ismail is particularly doing is showing that little hint of the face and really showing this strong kind of T uh, composition through this character. His use of white space as well with the negative shapes flowing through here create this nice period of rest, this kind of larger shape right through here, right in front of the focal point, which is our face. So there's not too much going on here around the character's face to distract us, to keep us from looking in and focusing and appreciating that. And then after we see that, after we focus on that, then we start to see the rest of the forms and appreciate some of that. And on an even deeper or third read, you start to look at some of these forms in the back and notice some of the stylized anatomy and you start to appreciate that more. So just kind of controlling the levels of read from first to second to third as you start to look at this character. We're gonna look at one more example here with this artwork. This is a beautiful example and I'm sure you can just ask yourself right now, where did I immediately look at this character? And I can almost guarantee this was probably the first place you focused your attention. And that is uh, very intentional. And we are going to grab this piece to look at this a little more closely. So we are naturally attracted to faces. And that is being used here to an extreme where we have this, you know, cute stylized face for not just the, the little girl here, but also for the uh, pterodactyl. And we have this cute interaction and storytelling going on here. She's obviously uh, some kind of writer and we start to get that storytelling as we look at that cute interaction between the two characters, start to see her outfit, 
start to see the saddle and everything starts to you know slowly come together but initially our focus is on that interaction and what is happening here is that that interaction is being framed so nicely here around the characters faces they're very close together um, you know, you have even some more visual interest going on with that hand being there as well. There's just a lot going on there to drive our attention. And then you can start to realize and appreciate a lot of the really beautiful work happening here. I mean, I I'm going to be honest, most people are not going to look at this belt and notice the really beautiful controlled level of texture happening here, happening on this area of the saddle. Most people aren't even going to look at the complexity going on here with these different forms, but there's a lot of beautiful shapes here. And just like what we talked uh, about with Entei, uh, Entei Ryu, there's a lot of beautiful texture happening here that is very much being controlled and only represented in a few areas to keep your attention kind of where it matters, up here flowing towards our main point of interest. We don't see a ton of that texture and form going on down here. However, there is some really beautiful sculpting going on there. The level of detail definitely increases as we slowly swoop forward here towards our main area of focus. And again, a lot of people aren't going to look at or even appreciate a lot of this stuff going on here. As a 3D artist, I know how much work and how difficult a lot of these shapes are to create. So, um, you know, you gotta think about your audience and think about what you're creating your piece for when it's being made. So a lot of things that we can learn here from Ismail, but we'll look at one more piece for this idea. And I'm actually going to zoom way out on this piece and just take a look at the initial or what I like to call the first read of an artwork and we can still make out the overall silhouette for this form. Let's take a closer look and try to understand and break this down a little more too. So with this piece, notice the level of detail, texture work, and complexity going on with the accessories here on the side and back of the character. A lot of texture, a lot of different forms going on here, a lot of really beautiful sculptural work. However, that is not where our attention is driven. Uh, Ismail is using the lighting and, you know, angle and position of the silhouette here to get our attention on the front half of this character and this overall kind of larger silhouette being represented very roughly and quickly there. So lighting is being used here to draw our attention to the composition, the larger composition and silhouette of this sculpt, of this form, essentially the primary reed, getting a lot of attention there initially. Notice again that beautiful negative shape being represented here. A lot of cool work happening in that area. Sorry, we, sorry we're getting a little messy. Uh, but then only after that, after you have that initial read, very um, striking, very cool silhouette, very cool pose. Then we can start to get in and look a little more and we see some of these scratches around the helmet, some of these cool folds around here, all these cool shapes, some of these details on the gun. And then we start noticing all these tertiary details and all these cool forms back here but only upon closer inspection. That first read, again, being so well done and so important with all of these characters, Ismail definitely knows what they are doing when it comes to driving the attention of their audience. And if you don't follow Ismail, Ente, or Pablo either, uh, go ahead and give them all a follow. Go ahead and check out more of their work, and I think that these are three really fantastic artists that we can learn a lot from. Hopefully you guys learned something new today. We'll be doing more of these in the future. If you guys are enjoying them, definitely let me know so I can make more of them. Click that like button if you guys enjoyed it. Maybe let me know down in the comments if you guys would like to see more of these and even some suggestions for some other artists we can study in the future. We did 2D last time, we did 3D this time. We're just gonna do a mixed bag of all the things here uh, if we do some more of these. But again, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.